introduce myself. <laughs> so, my name is Medina Alavi, and I'll be telling you about my father, Bartik Mazur. You're going to have to talk his, louder. Yeah. Who wrote his memoirs of World War II, which uh, were recently published in the book Five Prisons to Arnhem. A note about the cover. The purple letter P in a yellow background and then another purple was the badge or patch that all Poles who were captured, rounded up, or otherwise forced into slave labor had to wear. Um, they were forced into slave labor for the Germans. Um, and it had to be shown. We know, everybody knows about the Jewish star, which had to be shown, but there were also other situations like that. So, if not for the war, my father, Bartek, would never have left Poland. He graduated from high school, the High School of Humanities in Sosnowiec. If you want to put, yeah. So here's, um, Number one. yeah, this is where he was born, but here is, it, it was a border town, and it's called Sosnowiec. And he passed the maturity exam, which qualified him to enter university. He hadn't yet decided what he was going to study, but one idea was to go into the diplomatic course, since he was already fluent in several languages. And, then, uh, and one of them was German, which proved to be very useful during his escape from Poland. Uh, and the other idea was to become a concert pianist. He was by then quite an accomplished musician, and he had already composed several pieces for the piano. But one thing for sure, his course of studies was definitely not going to include anything that had to do with mathematics or sciences. <laughs> <laughs> so then, how is it that he ended up becoming a medical doctor? Again, the reason is because of the war, which began on September 1st, 1939, the same summer that Bartik finished high school. The Germans attacked in full force from, from the north, from the west, and from the south by land, sea, and air with overwhelming manpower and armaments. Nevertheless, the Poles defended themselves very well during this time until 17 days later when the Russians attacked from the east. Wow. So then, there was no hope of holding out against the two evil empires. The Polish army and the government evacuated, perhaps the other map now. Which one is the, oh, this is the, uh, we need the other, this is the wrong oh, power. Okay, point. that's fine. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. And put the other one. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's okay. It's the same. It's yeah. a couple of extra miles. Yeah. Anyway, the the Polish army and the government all evacuated south to Hungary. Oh uh, yeah, here. So you can see here, Germany now has come and taken over um, half the east, western half of Poland and the part that where my father grew up was actually annexed to the Third Reich. So, um, and then the Russians attacked, so they, they, they came down, some through Romania, but eventually into Hungary. And then from Hungary they wanted to get to France, then France collapsed, and uh, well, we'll see. Um, and my uncle Stasek was among those who evacuated south. The German invasion from the west was viciously brutal, with immediate suppressive consequences. 
All schools above fourth grade were closed. Polls were destined for eventual elimination through starvation and hard labor. And for this, they only needed minimal literacy and the ability to count to 100. My grandfather, Wadiswak Mazur, was director of the teacher's college in Sosnowiec. Germans were initially on a campaign to decapitate the country by getting rid of all the intelligentsia. To escape persecution, my 18-year-old father drove my 60-year-old grandfather from, to the Russian part. Sorry, I'll use the stick, yeah. Um, hoping there to find a better situation. But it was so chaotic and dreadful under the Russians that two and a half months later, my grandfather made the fateful decision that it was better to return home and try to survive under the Germans. Less than six months later, on April 15, 1940, my grandfather was arrested by Gestapo in Sosnovius. He was tortured for information on the secret underground organization called the Organization of the White Eagle because he was editor and publisher of its magazine newsletter. Um, and the ultimate purpose of that organization was to prepare for the uprising against the Germans and then reestablish a free Poland. So after brutal interrogation and detention by Gestapo, my grandfather was transported to Dachau concentration camp, and then he finally perished at Mauthausen Gusen camp in Austria, where he was sent for extraordinary punishment for being, according to the Germans, a, quote, fanatic Pole. During this time, my father, uh, did, did, you did show the white eagle, yeah. right? So during this time, my father worked as an unskilled laborer in a paper plant. He was lucky to have a job at all because whoever didn't have papers to prove that they were employed got sent to Germany for slave labor to replace the men there who were involved in the war effort. In the early years of the war, people actually did sometimes return from concentration camps. However, what did arrive from Mauthausen was the notice of my grandfather's death from so-called brain stroke on November 1st, 1940. In fact, in fact, we know the real cause of his death from a witness, Stanisław Gierz, born August 26, 1901, who testified at the Katowice branch of the Institute of National Remembrance on November 7, 1969, that my grandfather sat down, tired, and was then brutally beaten by a capo, you know, prison guard. And he later collapsed during roll call. This is a, an actual picture from Mauthausen concentration camp. And this was during a roll call. I just wanted to show that. Of course, I, my grandfather wasn't there, but you can see. Did they see the picture of the concentration? Yeah. It was after finding out about my grandfather's death that Baltic became steadfastly determined to seek revenge by killing Germans. One possibility was to join the underground resistance. However, as my father wrote in his memoirs, there were no underground units in the area where he lived. 
um, he did not know that his own father was involved in the underground. And furthermore, the thought of being captured and talking under torture was just simply um, intolerable. So he devised a plan of getting to the nearest neutral country, which was Switzerland, and presenting himself at the Polish embassy, which he believed would help him to get to the Polish forces which after the fall of France were then in Britain and Palestine. He shared his idea with two friends from elementary school and they agreed to the plan because they both wanted to get to Switzerland in order to study medicine in Winterthur. My father's fiance, Danka Dombrowska, helped then was an address to contact because she knew someone who was studying medicine in Winterthur. This is what my father wrote. My motivation and goals were influenced by the personal loss of my father at Mauthausen Busen. Vengeance was the motive for my choosing to escape from Poland to become a soldier as a most appropriate response to the needs of my country. I never questioned the validity of my friend's goals, which were to continue their education in neutral Switzerland and become physicians and survive the war and work to rebuild the devastated homeland. So the three boys chose uh, March 21st, 1941 as their D-Day, which was almost four months after my grandfather's death. Bartek persuaded Danka to accept his decision with a poem by Hungary's national poet called Pachofi Schande. And this is the poem. Liberty and love, these two I must have. For my love, I'll sacrifice my life. For liberty, I'll sacrifice my love. Bartek told his sister-in-law, Stasha, about his plans to leave Poland, but he did not tell his mother. The last time I saw my mother was when I was on my way to the railroad station. The streetcar that I took was passing by our house, and in fact, the stop was right in front of our apartment building. I got a glimpse of my mother's face it showed a mixture of distress, panic, and helplessness as she stood there frantically looking right and left. This must have been right after Stasha told her about my intentions. My mother did not see me as I had time to shift in the crowded car to hide my face. I was standing next to the window, which was partially covered by a poster announcing the date of execution of a list of so-called criminals condemned to death. I moved so that I could see my mother with one eye without being seen by her. At that, at that time, I did not know if I would ever see her again. And I felt guilty leaving. <laughs> Ding dong. <laughs> I felt guilty leaving without saying goodbye. This kind of poster was seen all over Poland and they were terrifying. 
This is in German and in Polish, and it says announcement. And in the condensed version is that the, um, that the chief of Gestapo and police in Warsaw, this is a real poster from, from Warsaw, and uh, announcing that four policemen and one SS soldier were killed by terror, so-called terrorists. And um, then, so 100 people who uh, were taken and uh, arrested uh, and shot in public in retaliation for the five Germans who were killed. This was all over Poland. Here, they had the names and the birth dates of the people that were killed in public, shot in public. So the three friends met at the train station and embarked on the long journey to Munich. So from Sosnowiec to, uh, to Munich. I think this is mute number three. No, that's Vienna. Mute here to yeah. Munich. They did go to Vienna first, but anyway, to Munich, uh, which was 500 miles from home and 135 miles from Winter Tour, their destination in Switzerland. So the last leg was very critical because they had to play it by ear. From Munich, they, they, they took another train to a little border town, which is as close to Switzerland as they could get, which I think is right here. From the station, they took a walk around so they could kind of taste the area. Then, while they were sitting down, eating food that they brought from home, they spotted a man in gray uniform with a gun. They nonchalantly got up to walk away without looking in the direction of the man. Suddenly, there was a gunshot. They dropped their suitcases, ran as fast as they could, and got away. At sundown, they walked back in the direction of Switzerland using a compass. Near dawn, when they saw the village sign for Tangen, um, uh, they saw the village sign for Tangen, they erupted in dancing and singing, Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła, which means Poland will not perish, which was the national anthem of Poland, or still is the national anthem. Their joy was truncated by an arresting Swiss officer. The three distraught boys got extradited back to Germany, to prison number one. Oh, you're kind of showing so. Yeah. And it's circled in red, and the red circles are the five prisons. So prison number one in Constance, Germany, on the picturesque Lake Bodin. Bartek was in solitary, and not knowing the duration of the confinement was the worst part. After six weeks, they were sent to slave labor. They had to undergo selection by a group of farmers who inspected their bodies for fitness for work. Bartek was the last to be chosen because of his hands, those of the pianist, made him a reject. He was scared at the thought of what would have happened if no one had chosen him. The three friends ended up being chosen by three different masters. And this separation made communication in order to coordinate another attempt into Switzerland difficult. <coughs> However, Bartek found ways, as he was always 
very clever in finding solutions to big problems, many of them daring and dangerous. So during this time as a slave laborer, a Gestapo agent came to where Bartik worked and lived. He interrogated him and searched all of his belongings, including his mattress, inside his mattress. He didn't find anything. Bartik surmised that Gestapo man was looking for the compass and map he had bought. But how the agent knew about it, about those things, Bartik never found out. But he had a good hunch who denounced him. The next attempt at reaching Switzerland required some ingenuity. Bartik told his master that for the anniversary of his grandmother's death, he was obligated to receive communion. After he finished his required chores for Sunday, he asked for permission to go to church. Before leaving, he went to his room, kissed Danka's picture, left it very visibly by his bed, along with the ring that Danka gave him when they exchanged rings in promise of marriage. Bartek and only one of the prospective medical students set out again for Switzerland. And instead of a warm welcome, when they arrived at the address in Winterthur, they were received not only with disbelief, but consternation because it was illegal for the residents to shelter them. So they went on to Bern, the <clears throat> capital. At the Polish embassy, they were again not believed. They were not issued passports and were given instructions on how to get to unoccupied France through Geneva, yeah, because uh, the Germans occupied half of France and the Vichy part, uh, the southern part of France, was an unoccupied zone. <clears throat> so, um, so uh, uh, yeah, and before they got to Geneva, um, Baltic sent a postcard to his mother so that she would know that he was alive and where he was. And if you can see, this is the postcard he sent from Switzerland, and this is from Madrid later on. But, um, and you can see here the, the Third Reich stamp, which is really kind of awful to look at. Um, the other side of the car. Oh yeah, this is this is the other, the other side of the car. This is a map of Zurich. Oh, you could do just that one. Good. Okay. <clears throat> when they reached the place where they were to cross uh, into France, just footsteps away, they were suddenly blinded by light and then saw the barrel of a gun and heard the astonishing words, Vous êtes Polonais, you are Polish. They ended up in prison number two in Geneva, which wasn't as bad as the German one. Patek even had the opportunity to speak Italian, French, German and Polish among the guards and the other prisoners, and he was the only one who knew all four languages. So it's kind of fun. Uh, after doing their time for three weeks, they were driven by prison guards to an empty field and were pointed in the direction of a tree beyond which was France. They were headed for Lyon, which is around here. 
they were headed for Lyon, where there was a delegation of the Red Cross. They walked by night and slept by day. On the second day, when they woke up from the ditch where they had been sleeping, they were arrested by a gendarme who took them to prison number three. Number nine. In an ancient small town called Vienne. This was the all time worst prison ever for Bartek. And his words explain it better than I can tell you. At the time, we were put in the dungeon. It, we were put in the dungeon, the 20 odd convicts, convicts already there were walking with tin bowls filled with a brownish, smelly liquid, liquid. At first, I thought they were washing their mess kits after a meal. But then, but then I saw them stop. Some of them sat down. Then to my horror, they all proceeded to ingest the malodorous brew slurping loudly as they emptied their, the bowls with great haste. It dawned on me that this was a meal and not a dishwashing party. When we turned away in disgust from the bowls meant for us, we saw the convicts grab the bowls and continue and consume the contents in record time. In that moment, we could not imagine ourselves in that role. But after three days of living on black coffee and bread, we were gladly polishing off this so-called soup from newcomers who would turn it down. After paying the 5,000 franc fine and serving the one month sentence, which was the standard punishment for not having a resident permit, uh, the two Polish youths continued on their way to Lyon. The Polish Red Cross in Lyon provided them with room and board. Bartek informed them that he wanted to join the clandestine evacuation network to go over the Pyrenees into Spain. It was a very long wait. So in the meantime, he enrolled at the university to study Shakespearean English, of all things. <laughs> then things changed drastically when Germans occupied the rest of France on November 11, 1942. And it was time to leave the country. Bartek didn't write anything about how he connected with a guide to get him and nine other people out of France. All he said about this adventure was that he didn't have to do any of the planning or thinking. He just had to follow orders precisely. When the group got to Perpignan, here, at the border with Spain, they had to walk silently in single file and no one was allowed to smoke, which wasn't a problem for my father. My father never smoked. They walked into the mountains and got into Spain on December 2nd, 1942 with the intention of reaching Barcelona. The British consulate in Barcelona. Suddenly the group was am ambushed by several armed agents of the Guardia Civil and taken to a farmhouse for detention. During the night, Bartik escaped through a bathroom window and walked alone for two days. As he was walking along a country road, 
the Guardia Civil agent approached him from the opposite direction. And yes, it was on to prison number four in Gerona, Spain. He spent 12 days sleeping on a concrete floor and then was shackled for three days to another young pole and put in a cattle car for the long ride to Miranda de Ebro concentration camp in Spain. Prison number five. Again, Bartek did not write very much about Miranda de Ebro. One anecdote which is not widely known is the fun the Poles had with a salute. They were obliged to shout twice a day at the rising and the lowering of the flag. This was Franco, Franco, Franco. Franco, you know, the dictator. <clears throat> Some must have certainly wondered at the delight with which the Poles shouted the similarly sounding. Does anybody here speak Polish? Good. Srango, srango, srango. And please excuse my French if I translate what that means in Polish. And if you're offended, please close your ears. <laughs> it means I shit on him. <laughs> <laughs> Bartek spent five months in this final imprisonment. And eventually, with the intercession of the Polish government in exile, which was in Britain, uh, the Vatican, and the Allies, um, <clears throat> the Polish prisoners were released in groups of 100 a day and transported to Madrid and then to Gibraltar. And uh, let me just tell you about, uh, this is Miranda de Ebro, and the camp was designed by Germans uh, during the Spanish Civil War, which was before the Second World War, so you can kind of see. And here is the one fountain with potable water for 5,000 people. And, uh, oh, okay. And uh, the other picture. And uh, this is the pic, these are all poles. It, uh, these, that's a stock um, film from the Polish government. So, <laughs> anyway, that picture, uh, they're all holding their, what are the vessel that they use for eating, and then the food is there on the ground that is going to be ladled into their plates for them to eat. After two and a half years on a long and sometimes harrowing trek, as a draft seeker, as my father used to say, he was a draft seeker as opposed to a draft dodger. Bartek finally became a soldier in uniform in the Polish army, but without a gun. Well, let's show the picture of Gibraltar again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is the rock of Gibraltar. And I chose this picture because it has a picture of a Dakota plane, which some of you may know what it was, used a lot during the war. But it's the kind of plane that when my father was a paratrooper, he jumped out of. He jumped out of a plane just like this. And that's the Rock of Gibraltar, which was uh, English, British territory which is when my father got to Gibraltar was the first time that he felt free uh, to sense the German invasion. 
Then when he got to Scotland, Bartek volunteered for the first independent Polish parachute brigade. The training was extremely rigorous and the grounds on which um, the soldiers did their training was nicknamed Monkey Grove, <laughs> which in a way, I mean, this kind of looks like, this is a sketch, there were many sketches that you show really, you know, horrible exercises. Um, and so this is one of those sketches. But this is an actual tower uh, that was uh, built uh, for parachute training, designed by Poles, in fact. The first tower was built in Poland because the Poles were very advanced before the war in paratroop training in preparation for what they knew would eventually would be an attack. Um, and then this, uh, this tower was copied from the original in Poland and put in Scotland where the paratroop brigade was. And then this very same, a copy of this exact tower was built at Rimway in England where the Allied paratroopers trained. An anecdote that a lot of people don't know. Paratroopers are not supposed to wear glasses. This is my father with glasses, without glasses. And we'll read this picture I'll talk about. But Bartek was intransigent with his intention to join the brigade and go fight for the freedom of Poland. At the examination site, he found excuses to get near the eye chart, and then when he got the opportunity, and then got the opportunity to copy it down. <laughs> and he did pass the eye exam with flying colors. <laughs> The whole reason for the creation of the Parachute Brigade was for it to be dropped in Warsaw to support the fighters in the event, what they knew would be the eventual and inevitable uprising. And the uprising had already started by this time on August 1st, 1944. The brigade was not dropped in Warsaw because the British command ordered it to be diverted in General Montgomery's ill-fated, badly planned Operation Market Garden, which was very well portrayed in the film, A Bridge Too Far. I'm sure many of you have seen it, A Bridge Too Far. This was excruciatingly painful for all those young Poles who overcame incredible odds to get to the brigade. And I just want you to see this picture. This is my father in officer training school with his glasses. This is his best buddy, Swabek, which you'll hear about. And this is Edek, the guy he was shackled to for three days. So this is the, okay, on the Dakota airplane. The red light meaning standby flashed and as I hooked up my static line to the cable, there was still time to think and many thoughts raced through my mind. Why not Warsaw? This was the 51st day of the uprising there. How long will this last? Will I ever see my mother again? If not, will Stashik ever see her? Stashik, no, his brother, my uncle. If not, will Stashik ever see her and tell her that I took part in this battle at Arnhem? Is my mother still alive? I had many thoughts about Danka and missing the chance of having a child. <coughs> I would rather be dead 
than maimed or crippled. Can the armor breast plate that I am wearing protect my heart if I am shot from below instead of straight on? If I were to lose a limb, let it be a foot rather than a hand. Otherwise, I would never play the piano again. Let me live until I kill at least one German. And if I do, let it be some SS man and not a brainwashed child, not a brainwashed teenager. As it turned out, he never fired his gun. And this troubled him for a long time until he went to medical school, until he started studying medicine. After jumping into Dril, south of the Rhine River near Arnhem, the Polish paratroopers were to make their way across the river uh, uh, to help the British soldiers who were being badly beaten. There were not enough boats, but Swabek got in one, and Barclay had what his foot right in after him. And then someone shouted at him to get out. That was the last time Barclay saw Swabek. And he did not know whether he was alive or dead until after the war. Swabek was captured and became a POW in Germany. After the battle of Market Garden, which became known as Hitler's last win, the brigade was sent on duty to guard bridges in the Netherlands. And uh, here is Bartek with the glasses. Standing on uh, or on guard duty in Hulman, uh, Netherlands, guarding the bridge over the Balmas Canal. And just as a little anecdote, this guy here gave my father a little dictionary of uh, Dutch and English. The war was still going on when Bartek was sent by the brigade to the Polish School of Medicine in partnership with the University of Edinburgh because doctors were needed immediately for the war effort and would be needed after the war. The term had already started several months earlier and Bartek had a lot of catching up to do. He had to spend nights alone with his cadaver in the morgue. And I took this photo in Edinburgh. This is where the morgue was and the, the body. Huh? And um, this is how the, the, the bodies were brought in through this door. And that was the dissecting room. Um, Bartek had been terribly worried about Swabek until they finally met again after the war in Edinburgh. They spent some time <clears throat> together then and then went their separate ways. Swabek <coughs> to Poland and Bartek stayed in Edinburgh. This is Bartek playing the piano and Swabek looking on right after the war. And so Bartek stayed in Edinburgh where he finished medical school and then went on to become a psychiatrist. Like so many others, he was forced to remain in permanent exile. The two friends lost contact with each other until 1994 when Bartek fortuitously decided to show up in Dril, where they were dropped at the 50th anniversary of the battle he fought in. And there, the two best friends and foxhole mates 
found each other and were reunited. So this is my father and this is Suave. And that's the story of the five prisons. Of course, there's a lot more in this book. <laughs> Comments. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. In all this tour, that's a terrible word to use, of all these prisons, generally speaking, what age was he? When they were going through all 19. Okay. 19. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. His father was killed when he was 18, and then he turned 19, left Poland when he was 19, and then he got to Scotland. Uh, in 43, so he was 22. But they were 24. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all, very, all this walk. Teenage or something. Yeah. yeah. And there were masses of Poles trying to get to the free, uh, to the Polish forces. And many of them um, were, came from Russia because the Russians, when they divided, uh, when Poland was divided and again wiped off the map, the, there were two million Poles, men, women, children, babies, deported to Siberia and to Kazakhstan. And many of those people, the young men, uh, ended up in the parachute brigade. And Swavik was one of those. He was what they called the Siberiak. And they, they went through excruciating, horrible. And then the others, you know, who came this way, and just many thousands. There were like, I think about 150,000 Poles who remained in Poland, uh, in Britain after the war. Yeah. But they did get back to Poland. They did get what? They did get back to Poland eventually. Most of them did, could not return back to Poland because those kids and men who fought with the Allies, like my father, when they went back to Poland, and Poland by then was run by Stalin, mm. okay? It was the Soviet takeover. Mm. It was not, it was, so those, it, it was crazy. Uh, they were called, well, those people like my father who fought with the Allies and went back to Poland were persecuted, all of them. Some mildly, well not so mildly, like his friend Swavik, who had a high degree in economics, he could only get a job working at, as in a shoe store and stuff, things like that. Many were killed, they were tortured brutally by the communists, and then, um, uh, and many, many, many were killed and disappeared. So they really couldn't go back. And in fact, there, are, there were kids who, because the British, you know, kind of wanted the Poles to go back to Poland. Okay, you know, you fought, you, we won, thank you very much, goodbye, go back home. And uh, there were boys who committed suicide rather than going back to Poland. And my uncle definitely could not go back to Poland because he would have been one of those that would have been imprisoned and probably executed. He was much older than my father. And he was an officer in the, in the military. So uh, does that answer the question sufficiently? <laughs> yeah, so some did go back, yeah but most did not. Did he ever go back to Poland? Yes. Uh, in 1964, he and my mom went back for the first time. And it was a little bit, you, you might want to tell them what it was like. Well, it was quite frightening because go, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, it was very scary to go back. First of all, to this oppressive regime, this oppressive, behind the Iron Curtain, and then with the history. As it turned out, um, he, I think he had to report every day to the police. No, no, just for a long interview, okay. interview what, ma'am? He had to uh, present himself 
to the police in Poland and uh, was interviewed for a long time. I guess they wanted to decide whether they should arrest him or not. And I sat there outside, didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, so that was the first time. He didn't see his mother for 23 Three. years. 23. 23 years. Wow. Yeah. They yeah. didn't have a reunion. Yeah. But she, and later, then, she later came and lived with us uh, from, uh, it's from 68 until she passed away. Yeah, and then um, Leszek and my parents and I, we went in 1966 to Poland, and that was the first I, I saw my grandmother. I, it was just, I had a grandmother, <laughs> and I, I didn't have any other grandparents, but. Wasn't Poland more neutralized though later on? Uh, the communists didn't hold on to it. Uh, well, right, right you've there. heard of Solidarność, right? Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Lech Wałęsa. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the movement, actually the fall of the wall started with the movement in Poland. Yes. And the rise of the, first it was, well, the students rose and they expected the the workers to join them, which they didn't. Then the workers <laughs> rose up and they expected the students to join them. And they said, well, you didn't join us. We won't join you. So then there was another big uprising and that's really where communism fell. That was in the 80s. 80s yeah. Are the communists still in Poland? Oh, oh, no. No, 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 not at all. Not yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, or depends on your political um, outlook, but the government in Poland is very right-wing and uh, kind of like Hungary and Turkey. And it's uh, most people, I mean, everybody in our family and all the friends that we have are not happy with this particular government. We would like to have a more less dictatorship-like government. Yeah, how, how, the, how, how is the family life changing with all the Ukrainians coming? Do you know anything about that? Yes. Um, they're very, very visible. You know, there's Ukrainians everywhere now. And um, they've actually started doing kind of, kind of like what the Mexicans do for us here, you know, you have Ukrainian doctors and professors doing what other people don't want to do. So in a way, they've helped the economy. Mm -hmm. That's good. What is Ukraine? The Ukraine is uh, over here. In fact, Ukraine was, uh, half of it was part of Poland. <clears throat> was uh, Polish, and then Stalin, <clears throat> when he got together with uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, the three of them kind of carved up Europe, and Stalin said, I want this land, which was, here, there's Ukraine, which was Polish, not all of it, but most of it. Uh, he got it, and that's how Poland, and there are a lot of Poles who um, were forced out of the Ukraine. And many of them were then moved over to the part of Poland that um, was um, Silesia, which is where my father grew up. Uh, and they went over to that side. Russia won Yeah. yeah. Well, they took, they took from Iran, they took from any... They, they lost Ukraine, and that's why they fought in there, because they wanted to get it back. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, they just annexed the Crimea. Sorry? Yeah, so they just annexed, annexed the Crimea. Right. Nobody said anything about it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Voracious. <laughs> so, at what time did he come to the States? States? Well, he came to the States uh, in 1956. 
But first, he, he, uh, our family went to Canada in 1953, and then in 1956 uh, to the States. Was he welcomed here? Well, at that time, there was kind of a need for doctors. Uh -huh. And I mean, it wasn't easy because there were many problems, many things. I read stacks and stacks of letters. and. He was stateless. All these Polish boys who fought um, lost, um, they, they lost their Polish citizenship and they didn't acquire British citizenship or wherever they were. They were stateless yeah. without a country. And as you can imagine, for anything, that would make it difficult. They weren't illegal, but they were stateless. They didn't have a country. And without papers and everything, well. He did have papers. They did have documents, he did. which were travel documents, which showed that they were stateless, okay. but they were not illegal. Yeah. But he came from Edinburgh, the family, to Canada and then Canada to the United States. I want to, can I tell you a little anecdote of my, how clever my father was? Sure. <laughs> but this opens up a lot of other things. But um, my brother and I <clears throat> were in a, uh, in, in a boarding school. And uh, my father came and got us from there. And, and that's a whole, that's a whole yeah, other story. Another story. Yeah, but this is yeah. the part that's, yeah, I just want to tell you this little that's part. Round two. Yeah, my, mo uh, my mother, who was my father's first wife, um, my biological mother, not my mom. This is my mom. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, my parents and I went to visit my mom. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. my mother, you know, that kind of, it's kind of, a, anyway. Um, so my mother had uh, our documents and our visas to come into the States. My father only had his travel documents and uh, he had us two kids. Now, we were British subjects because we were born in Britain, in Edinburgh. So, and Canada at that time was a dominion of the UK. So, from Europe, uh, we got to Canada. And my father, by then, was living in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, uh, how to get us home without documents? Well, we got, went to, uh, I think it was, he said, Windsor. And it was late at night, on purpose, on a bus. And my father had an overcoat and he put it on the seat. Remember the back bench of a bus, you uh -huh. guys? Uh -huh. You know, they had a bench. Uh -huh. and, and that. Oh, really? say, I, didn't, I don't know. Yeah? Uh, I don't know if you think. Yeah, well, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there, but I know that. And he put his coat there so they could, so sleep. That we could fall asleep <laughs> conveniently. <laughs> then when it, got to the border, the bus got to the border, the official comes on the bus and checks everybody's documents. And of course he gets to my father and looks at his weird document and uh, says, thank you very much, doctor. Are these your kids? And my father said, yes. Who they are sleeping. <laughs> and uh, then he said, well, uh, and you have their documents? And my father goes, oh, I must have left them in the coat. <laughs> Do you want me to wake up my daughter? <laughs> I can see him say that. Oh, but I that. So she was an illegal alien. <laughs> so was he. Undocumented. So That's was she. We were able to wake up the kids. Huh? They didn't no, no, up. no. They said, oh, okay. <laughs> they believed him. They thought, yeah, he has a <laughs> You were really asleep. Uh, yeah, I was really asleep. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I, no, I, 
that I don't even remember that particular. That he thing. was nervous every time there was a knock on the door when they got to Cincinnati because he thought somebody had, you know, found out they were not here legally. <laughs> they were. I didn't know that. But that was later corrected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And immigration uh, was very understanding, of course. You know, uh, maybe now it's different, but then. Oh, the poor guy, he's got his kids here, and his wife is in Italy, and she doesn't want to come, and uh, he's got these kids, you know. That's <laughs> not what he told them. You don't know that story either. <laughs> <laughs> what did he tell them? Well, he, he went there, and he told them that the children, now the children were in Hamilton, Michi Michigan, on the other side of the border, or I think that's right. And uh, and it, he told he told the authorities that they were with his brother in Nova Scotia, which they weren't. And they said, "Oh well, all you have to do is bring the children and get and and present them, and then we'll give you the documents." So he goes back across the border of Canada, oh, yeah. United States, gets the children, takes the children, presents them. Except that we were with him the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so we had to go out and come back legally. So how many children? Two? Well, these two at that time. Uh -huh. He's younger than me. Okay. And then my mother and father divorced, and then, um, then Kay uh -huh. married us, and we married her. Okay. That's, that's so it's, we married her and she married us. Your and that's the way it was. Your it mother really came was with you? Huh? Your mother came? She came um, later. She did later. come. We, we got here in 57. Uh -huh. And my mother came a year and a half later, a mm -hmm. year and a half uh -huh. later. Uh -huh. And then it was a miserable family situation. They got divorced. And. Uh, and we always stayed with our father. Kate, did you adopt him? No, there was no reason. It, it was him. impossible because my mother was alive. And also, your father had you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> my mother got custody, uh, but so le legally, legally, we yeah. were supposed to live with her. But my stepfather didn't want us there. And, you know. So, and, and we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to stay with my father. And then when we found Kay, you know, we, we had a family. Kay. <laughs> she was out on the street somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hit the oh, jack. Hey, the two <laughs> okay. You were the last chance, Kay. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you all coming. Yeah. Adina has a fascinating story unto herself. He oh. has one. We all have interesting stories. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know you guys need to go to different. Right. 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 Right